Welcome everyone and thanks for tuning in. This is the third in a series of four talks on the historic Silk Roads, the trading network that connected east to west traversing the Asian continent. If you've missed the first two talks, no worries. I will get you up to speed with a quick overview before we look at our topic for today, the area between the Sogdian city of Samarkand and Xi'an, the capital of multiple Chinese dynasties. Oh, the name Silk Road is misleading, since it was not really a road at all, or even a specific route. There was no single path or highway like the name suggests, but it was rather a network of trails and roads that connected villages and towns and cities. And most of the traders and merchants operated a local route near their home, so they would just do round trips between a couple of cities or towns. The few caravans that did go the long distances were usually diplomatic envoys carrying gifts from one ruler to another. But even in these cases, you would still hire local guides at each stop and pack animals for each leg of the trip moving from town to town. Towns where multiple roads intersected became commercial centers for the region, and as they grew, their cultural importance would grow as well. Most of the objects that Silk Road merchants dealt with were fairly mundane items like salt, or oil, basic pottery, and so forth. Few would have bothered with luxuries like fine gold jewelry or perfumes. For one thing, the more expensive an item is, the fewer people can afford it, meaning that there was simply not a large market for such items. Additionally, the further that one traveled to buy or sell items, the greater the risk involved, whether it was being robbed by bandits, losing merchandise while fording a river, or going through dangerous terrain, so it made sense logically and economically for the majority of merchants to operate in a particular area and to handle goods with a solid market. So does this mean that there was no Silk Road? That this is really just a myth? Well, no, not at all especially when we talk about the Silk Road as a kind of concept, as a shorthand term for the circulation of goods, ideas, images, languages, and more across and within the continent of Asia. We know for a fact that silk textiles manufactured in Byzantine Syria made their way to Nara, Japan. We know that Roman glassware was placed in Korean royal tombs. And we know that Chinese porcelain traveled to Iran. We know Buddhism spread beyond India along trade routes, and we also know that Islam was introduced to Indonesia and Southeast Asia by Arab traders who were following the maritime routes between China and Persia. So the Silk Roads were very real in the sense of an exchange network that played a critical role in shaping history and cultural development. Today, we're addressing the portion of this network between Samarkand and Xi'an, the capital of multiple Chinese dynasties for a few hundred years, and often considered to be the eastern end of the Silk Roads. So if you were a traveler trying to move between Xi'an and Samarkand, or vice versa, the first thing that you'd have to consider is the topography that you're passing through. So this map shows us the topography of Asia, and you'll notice that practically this entire section is occupied by mountains. The area outlined in white is the Tibetan Plateau, which is essentially just one gigantic mountain range. Mountains are not good places for travel. The paths are difficult. The weather can change suddenly, even in summer. Avalanches and rock slides can wipe out entire caravans, and it really just takes a long time. So as far as possible, then, we'd like to minimize our mountain travel, which then leaves this area as the optimal place for a route, a place called the Tarim Basin. The only problem is that this flat area here is the Taklamakan Desert. Now, the Taklamakan is the second largest shifting sand desert in the world, which means that it consists entirely of sand dunes, so there's no real solid ground to speak of. And if you've ever tried to run on the beach, you know how difficult that is, so this is like that times 10. Additionally, the climate is very hot in the summer, cold in the winter, there are very few water sources, and it is, in fact, so dangerous that 
the local Uyghur tradition claims that Taklamakan means you go in, but you don't come out. So what we find in practice then is that the roots either go far to the north, avoiding the area entirely, or they cling to the foothills that frame the desert to the north or south. But all three routes near, meet near the oasis town of Dunhuang before then entering Chinese territory. What's strange is that this really desolate region was historically apparently bustling with activity. Many groups over the centuries have occupied or left their traces in the region, whether they were ruling it as political states or they just had cultural influence there of some sort. And we can really see this from the number of languages that have been preserved on various documents found in the area. Some of them are from quite distant lands like Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And frankly, the number and diversity of languages and scripts found in the Tarim Basin is amazing. So despite its harsh climate, this area seems to have been among the most active and cosmopolitan regions in the world for nearly a thousand years. So who exactly lived here? And what did they leave behind? Well, we'll start today by looking at some of the earliest archaeological discoveries in the Tarim Basin. It so happens that the harsh climate is also perfect for preserving organic matter, like paper, textiles, food, hair, and skin. In fact, bodies from multiple different cultures across a very long period of time have been found throughout the Tarim Basin. We're looking here at the graves of a culture that we rather awkwardly call the Xiaokhu Gumagao Ayala Mazar Cultural Complex. These are the names of the three cemeteries where their remains have been found. I'm just going to refer to it as short version as Xiaokhu. So basically, as archaeologists worked on these different sites, they noticed really close similarities in the burial practices, grave goods, material culture, and the estimated dates at these three different sites, suggesting that the three cemeteries were used by the same cultural group of people. So the images I'm showing you here are from the Xiaohu Cemetery. You can see that they place posts at the head and foot of each grave. And here on the left is a uh, museum installation showing what some of the coffins looked like. They're described as being boat shaped. And on the right are two archeologists who are working with a recently excavated coffin. The coffins are made of wood. And uh, as I mentioned, take the shape of boats with lids that are so tightly fitted that they're basically create an airtight compartment, protecting and preserving their continent tents. So these three women were all from this Xiaokhu culture and from around the same time, around 1800 BCE. All three are wrapped in a blanket or a cloak and have hats or hoods. Uh, feathers were worn for ornament, as you can see on the right. And this woman on the right was also buried with a comb, a woven basket, and a tool for winnowing grain. All three women are so incredibly well preserved that they actually still have their hair and even eyelashes intact. Now, sometimes these bodies are referred to as mummies, and it's important to note that their preservation was due to the climate, so the extreme dryness and the high salinity of the soil. It was not due to any human intervention, so these were what we would call naturally created mummies. They are not embalmed or treated through human intervention in any way. Perhaps the most interesting thing about these women and their culture is that they don't seem to match any other cultural group that we know about. So their burials included boats, oars, and fishing nets, which seems very strange for a desert people, but there are actually two major seasonal rivers in the Tarim Basin when the snow of the surrounding mountains melt each summer. Now, much, or actually pretty much all of that water is diverted for agriculture, but even a hundred years ago, there was a sizable enough river that you could take a boat across the desert. So it's not completely bizarre to have these oars and boats show up. Now, the Shankru culture didn't use ceramics or pottery, uh, which is unusual, and so they made woven baskets, but pretty much all the surrounding cultures had pottery. Dental analysis tells us that they had a heavy diet of dairy, and they kept sheets 
sheep and goats for milk and for making textiles. So this woman here, for example, has this beautiful white hat and uh, blanket that were made of felted wool. These people also must have practiced farming because grains of wheat and millet were found. And finally, the bodies from these cemeteries have what we would call Caucasoid features. That is, physical and genetic features that are typical of European, Middle Eastern, North African, and North Eurasian populations. Many have red hair, like this woman here, and others have genes for blonde hair. So where did they come from? Did they migrate, perhaps, into the Tarim Basin from the West? Well, this was the theory for a while, and there's been a great deal of debate over it. But the most recent genetic analysis suggests that this was essentially an indigenous population. So yes, they came from someplace else in the sense that everyone must have come from somewhere, but they split off from every other group so early that they were essentially unique. They were an indigenous, isolated population in the Tarim Basin. One detail from these excavations of the Xiaohur cemeteries that I find interesting, personally, is this little object here. It's a carved wooden core that is wrapped in wool felt with a little hood that ties in a little bow here to create kind of a figure. It's almost imitating the clothing worn by the women I showed you earlier. Notice that there are several thin red lines drawn horizontally across the face. And this is interesting because in this burial, also from Xiaohe, a woman was buried with this little pouch here marked as C, which contains a mixture of the mineral hematite and cattle heart to create what is basically a red crayon. And if you look at her face marked in image B, uh, you'll notice that there are multiple thin red lines painted across her face, just like our little guy on the left. And there are even red stripes woven into the blanket wrapped around her body, and then sewn across the pouch holding the crayon-like substance. What does this mean? We don't know, but it clearly had some sort of significance for this culture. Now, by far the best dressed mummy of the Tarim Basin is this guy, Inpan Man. He was named for a place where he was found, and he's dated to much, much later than the women we were just looking at, so around 300 to 500 CE, and he has no relation to the Shokhe culture. He has a mask, as you'll see, with a strip of gold leaf on it covering his face, and then painted features uh, on it, eyebrows, eyes, a little delicate mustache. And you can see um, the photo on the right isn't as good a quality as the one on the left, but it does show you the three-dimensionality of the mask a, a lot better. And our Ying Pan man is dressed, as you can see, in these really fabulous silks. He's uh, really just dressed to the nines in rich fabric. Underneath all of this, the body is really in pretty bad shape, but we do know that he was very tall, six feet, six inches, and he was also clearly extremely wealthy. And because we can tell from the design of this silk that it was manufactured far to the west in the Sasanian or Byzantine empires. He must have also had some connections to be able to get this fabric in the first place. In fact, archaeologists have proposed that Ying Pan Man was a Sogdian merchant. And we looked at the Sogdians last time. They were an Iranian people whose homeland was around the city of Samarkand, but they had a very large expat community. In fact, they were the largest ethnic minority in the Chinese Tang Empire. So the Sogdians were very well positioned, literally and figuratively, to be merchants and traders of international goods. So on the right, I'm showing you a Sogdian woman playing a harp-like instrument uh, from a mural at Panjakant. But for the Chinese, the Sogdians were known as merchants and traveling entertainers. And this stereotype developed of Sogdians as having these big noses, big bushy beards, conical sort of floppy hats, and a taste for grape wine. The figure on the left is a Chinese Tang Dynasty produced a ceramic figure showing a Sogdian merchant riding on a camel. 
And this stereotype of the um, large nose, large beard, um, semi-drunken merchant uh, it was ing so deeply ingrained in East Asian culture that there's actually a stock character in Japanese plays called the Drunken Barbarian King, and it's derived from caricatures of this Sogdian stereotype. Uh, one of probably the best examples of how the Silk Roads enabled the spread of ideas and development of new cultural trends is the expansion of Buddhism beyond India. Buddhism originated in the Ganges River Valley around 500 BCE, so before the Common Era, and eventually spread throughout Asia, including the Tarim Basin, where it took on a visual form shaped by the international character of the area, as we'll see today. Now, for now, just to start, I want to give you the briefest of introductions to Buddhism. It was founded by the teacher Siddhartha Gautama and reached its height a few hundred years later during the Gupta period, before declining in popularity in India and being really largely replaced there by Hinduism. But it continued to spread and grow outside of India, where it became and remains very popular. So when Siddhartha began his teaching, the sort of standard belief was that people are trapped in this cycle of birth and death and rebirth that is inherently painful and full of suffering. Siddhartha was born as a prince, but he rejected that life after being really shocked by the condition of the poor. So he tried living an ascetic lifestyle for a while, uh, eating the bare minimum, embracing suffering, and so forth, before deciding that this path didn't hold any answers either. So instead, he preached a middle way of balance, simplicity, a, a giving up of striving. And he taught that our suffering is due to our attachments, so our desires, our pride, but even so-called wisdom. These are all illusions that keep us trapped in our own suffering and prevent us from ascending to enlightenment and achieving a state of non-being outside of this cycle of death and rebirth. Now, eventually, Siddhartha achieved enlightenment, a higher level of understanding that enabled him to be freed from this cycle. Siddhartha thus became a Buddha. Buddha meaning one who is enlightened or has achieved enlightenment. So there's actually multiple Buddhas because multiple beings can achieve enlightenment. And from its very beginnings, Buddhism is what we call a proselytizing religion. That is, its practitioners actively sought to win converts and to teach Buddhism to others, to mission to others. Um, Buddha had five primary students, and those students then took on their own students, and so on and so forth. And traveling monks and missionaries carried the Buddha's mes message out of the Ganges River Valley into the rest of Asia, spreading Buddhism over the course of hundreds of years. Interestingly, although Buddhism took hold quite well in East Asia, it hit a bit of a wall in Bactria and Sogdiana, since the Iranian world was already Zoroastrian. Uh, Buddhist monks did travel west to Persia, uh, but they didn't have the same success as they did in the east. Now, these Buddhist monks and missionaries walked on the same roads used by merchants and travelers, the roads that make up the network that we call the Silk Roads. And as they traveled, the monks brought with them their own familiar traditions and practices. For example, the creation of caves for use as temples and monasteries. Among the most famous of these cave complexes is Ajanta in India, and here you can see the many artificial caves that have been cut out of the cliff. So these are not constructed. They were not built up like bricks. They were carved out. It's a subtractive process. And the resulting chambers could be used as prayer spaces, as private rooms, uh, or serve various other functions for the community of monks there. This tradition was carried with monks to the Tarim Basin, where we'll look at three of these Buddhist cave complexes, the caves at Kizil, Bezeklik, and Mogao. The Thousand Buddha Caves at Kizil are frankly not in great shape. Uh, they've been damaged by the elements over time, by intentional vandalism, iconoclasm, that is vandalism for ideological reasons, and there have also been extensive renovations, as you can see in the top right photo, uh, to make the caves more accessible to tourists. 
And over time, people from various nations have removed paintings and sculptures from the site. So the bottom photo is actually just a half or a third of a panoramic photo taken in 1904 by the German archaeological expedition uh, to document the caves. And each cave is numbered in the photo, as you can see, and there are a lot of them. And again, this is just a fragment of the whole photo. So the caves themselves vary in size from small to large. Some are quite simple, others more elaborate. And we're going to look at just a couple of examples of some of the paintings that decorated these cave temples. Now, the diagram on the left shows us the typical layout of a temple cave at Kizil. The rock here is very soft, which makes it easy to carve, but it also makes it fragile. So it is structurally necessary to not carve out the entire space, but instead to leave a section of rock in the center. But this intact central rock pillar has another function as well. It acts as a stupa. Now, a stupa is a large circular mound that is meant to symbolize the world mountain in Buddhist thought. The so walking around or circumambulating a stupa is a central ritual in Buddhism. It's meant to facilitate meditation, to direct prayer, and also to express devotion. The cave temples then have their own built-in stupas, essentially, with this central column and then two corridors on either side of it, and then a room behind so you can walk around in a circle. Although there are some sculptures, most of the cave decorations are painted on the walls by monks trained in painting. And although I'm going to refer to these as frescoes, I want to note that they're not what we call true frescoes or fresco vero. In true fresco, pigment is applied directly to the plaster while it's still wet. And in the case of the caves at Kizil and other locations, the pigment is applied using a sort of beeswax mixture to the plaster once the plaster has already dried. So typically, the ceiling has a pattern like this top right photo with lots of Buddhas, uh, so-called Thousand Buddha pattern. And each seat is seated cross-legged on a lotus throne, encircled by a halo and a mandorla, and set in this sort of scalloped diamond shape. It not only creates a decorative visual pattern, but it also reflects this idea that all creatures have the capacity for enlightenment, that there are, in fact, many, many Buddhas. And the visual repetition of this simple motif makes it seem like there's an infinite number of Buddhas hovering above the visitor, as if we've just stepped into a space in which the different steps towards enlightenment are visible. The lower register in these temples, shown at the bottom right, usually shows the Buddha teaching, so surrounded by different beings listening to his sermon. And you'll notice where this subject is placed. It's lower on the wall, so easily accessible. It's at our level, which means that the Buddha is addressing us in this space. We are being taught and approached by him. He comes down to our level to teach us, down from the ceiling, which represents the space of enlightenment. The caves were often carved and pa painted by monks, but that was paid for by various sponsors or patrons. So rulers, kings could commission temples, but really anyone with sufficient money. And the donors were often included in the paintings, and that's probably what we see here in these life-size figures. This is from the same cave as the paintings that I just showed you. And one of the interesting things about these sword bearers is their identity. So here's a line drawing uh, to uh, just clarify what we're looking at. There are four men moving in a line from right to left, and they all have short red hair. And like these Sogdian banqueters from Panjikent, they're wearing long jackets called kaftans, with a trim at the collar, sleeves, and down the center. At the waist is a belt with a short dagger and then a much longer sword. And they wear boots on their very dainty, exaggeratedly small feet. And this clothing is worn in the Iranian world, not a Chinese or Uyghur fashion. And sometimes these donor figures at Kizil are identified as Sogdian, but that's actually probably incorrect. When these paintings were created, Kizil was part of the kingdom of Kucha. And there's a lot we don't know about the Kuchians, but they're described by Chinese visitors as having blue eyes and red hair. And their language, uh, Kuchian, is 
or was, an Indo-European language that is sometimes also called Takarian B. And as the local nobility, Kuchians would have sponsored many of the caves at Kizil, and we know that they were primarily Buddhist, unlike the Sogdians, who were Zoroastrian. Here is another fresco from Kizil showing the Kuchian royal family at the time. It is not in great shape, but you can see that we have a queen in the center uh, in her turquoise dress. The king is to the right. Uh, he's holding a small container as an offering for the Buddha, who would have been painted in a different wall on the same cave. Uh, and then we have two princes to the left. And if we compare the youngest prince with our sword bearers from the previous cave, excuse me, their apparel is very similar. It's much more similar than what we saw with the Sogdian banqueters. And the prince here, you'll notice, even has similar short red hair to the men at left. And so all of this allows us to pretty firmly identify these sword-bearing donors as being Kuchingan nobility. Most of the documentation on Kizil Caves was done by this man, uh, Albert Grunvedel, who is shown here at one of the caves at Kizil, where he's working on producing a copy of the frescoes there. Uh, here's an example of some of his work. And these reproductions that he created are especially essential since many of the frescoes at Kizil have been lost entirely or damaged beyond recognition. Uh, Grunvedel was an expert in Indian culture, a so-called Indiologist, and he and Albert von Lecoq, who was another German archaeologist, uh, they did much of the archaeological and documentary work throughout the Tarim Basin. Von Lecoq was also responsible for remo removing most of the best frescoes from Kizil. And in his journal, von Lecoq proposes that their removal was necessary due to the extent of the intentional vandalism of the images carried out by locals. So here we're looking at our fresco from earlier on the right, and on the left is a fresco uh, from a different site we'll look at in a moment, Bezeklek. And in both cases, you can see that the faces have been scratched out. They've been intentionally defaced. And the reason is because around 1338, the population of the Tarim Basin was converted to Islam as Muslim forces conquered the region. So there is a very strict prohibition in Islam against images of humans and even animals, depending on the interpretation. And the fact that these frescoes were Buddhist made it even worse. They were idols to a, a false religion. So if you were to go to Kizil today, it would look absolutely nothing like it did a hundred or so years ago because it's just been so damaged. At any rate, whether you consider the removal of the frescoes from Kizil to be an example of colonial exploitation by an imperialist power, or whether you think the removal was a legitimate decision, the frescoes that are in museums that have been removed are in very good condition and they give us some idea of what the rest of the site might have looked like. This is a detail of a very, very large fresco that's showing a deity on the left and then a musician on the right. And you'll note the delicate and graceful lines that make up their features. This is a very uh, elegant, refined sort of brushwork. You notice the intricate decorative details that are visible in the cloth the jewelry, and in the background, this almost jewel-like patterning that is so precise and so detailed that it is almost painstaking. This style of painting belongs to the Indian artistic tradition, which suggests that the artist responsible for this work either came originally from India or was himself trained by an Indian painter. And while it is in excellent condition, there's some question about how much the colors have changed over time in these frescoes. We do know that the light pigments of many of the frescoes have oxidized and darkened over time. The photo on the right is from another one of the cave complexes um, at the caves of Mogao, and it shows a wall where the top layer of paint has been removed and revealing an earlier fresco underneath. So the second layer, the later layer, is on the right, and the first and older layer is on the left. You'll notice that the flesh tones of the dancer on the left were protected from the air by the overpainting, so they have not oxidized. 
On the right, though, the paint used for the Buddha figures has turned from a lighter shade to a flat black in which we can't see any details. So sometimes when you see these frescoes, if it seems like there's a lot of very dark black in sort of odd places, it's probably because it was actually a lighter shade that has darkened over time. Now, the next caves that we will visit on our tour are at Bezeklik. It's farther east than Kizil, and it's in territory that was controlled by various Uyghur kingdoms for several hundred years. The name Beziklik is actually a Uyghur name meaning place of paintings or where the paintings are. But when von Lecoq and Grunewald arrived at the site, most of the caves had been filled in with sand, which was actually good because it served to hide and protect the paintings from the elements and from vandalism. One of the interesting things at Beziklik is that we can see evidence that many different peoples paid for caves there. So as we might expect, given its location, many of the caves were sponsored by Uyghur rulers, just as the Kuchian nobility sponsored caves at Kizil. So here are fragments from one of the caves at Beziklik, cave number nine. On the left are Uyghur princes, and on the right are princesses. And these are just left, what's left of what would have been much larger scenes with additional people, all approaching the Buddha. And next to each figure, you'll notice that there is a rectangle where the figure's name could be written. Now, these are not exactly portraits. You can see that each figure is pretty similar. But by writing the names here, the painting becomes a kind of family tree. It's like recording the family members' names, and it also serves to present them to the Buddha. It's sort of like signing your name on a group card for somebody's birthday. You still get the credit. Turning to another cave at Beziklik, this is cave number 20. We have two very well-preserved frescoes that depict the same subject. It's something called a pranihi, or vow scene, which is among the most popular types of images at Beziklik. And these images are also very uh, standardized and hierarchical. So the Buddha is at the center. He's surrounded by attendants and devotees. Uh, and he is, has a halo behind his head and then a type of sort of full body halo called a mandorla. He is making a gesture or a mudra called gyan mudra that signals the unity of the self with the universe. So it's a gesture associated with knowledge and enlightenment. And stylistically, there is a lot going on here. It's very detailed. There's lots of repeating zigzag patterns in green, red, black, and tan. It is like there is just no empty space in either of these images. At the bottom of each scene are the donors who commissioned the work. And they're shown here in the same space as the Buddha, presenting their gifts to him, so honoring him. Let's look at the features of these people who are gathered here. You'll notice that they all have large noses, large beards, and that the person at the top right actually has very striking pale green eyes. Note that in addition to the gifts the men are holding, there are also a camel and a donkey at the bottom right who are carrying bundles of goods as if these men are merchants who brought their caravan here to Beziklik to offer it all to the Buddha. This poor guy in the bottom right has had his face scribbled out in an act of vandalism, but these men were probably Sogdians. In the same cave is the similar scene with the same arrangement, and again, the donors are shown with large noses, large beards, and in the case of the man on the far right, red hair. Again, a camel, a donkey, and now a horse are here carrying offerings to the Buddha on the left. We can imagine that the donors who commissioned the creation of this cave temple and its paintings were involved in trade that's signaled by these in these frescoes by the presence of these pack animals carrying bundles, a little signal to their profession. It's especially interesting to consider how the different groups of people chose to be depicted. The Sogdians favored a style of clothing and personal adornment that was more in line with Iranian cultures. And the Uyghurs, by contrast, are wearing more Chinese fashions with carefully trimmed facial hair, distinctive hats, and long silk robes. Now, in the 8th century, the ruler of the local Uyghur kingdom of Gaocheng converted to the Manichaean religion. And Manichaeism is a rather complex religion that was founded around the year 230 CE in Persia by a guy named Mani, who claimed to be a prophet and preached a theological worldview. 
in which there is an existential battle between the divine light, which is good, and the forces of evil. Jesus, Zoroaster, and Buddha were considered prophetic embodiments of the divine light sent to teach sent by it to teach mankind. So um, the divine light is sort of taking human form. And they also were intended to pave the way for Mani himself, who was another messenger of the light. And although Manichaeism spread quite far, all the way from Persia to France to China, we have very little Manichaean art and very few documents. So the presence of several Manichaean frescoes at Beziklik is really exciting. It's also really striking how totally different the style is here compared to the previous paintings we've looked at. Instead of being packed with colorful patterns and very loud colors, we have a very quiet symmetrical composition with linear forms on a white black background. Now some of the original paint has worn away over time, but there is enough to see that we have a tree in the center with three trunks, and perhaps this is a reference to the pr three previous manifestations of the divine light, to Jesus, Zoroaster, and Buddha. The tree's foliage at the top creates a canopy that fills the, the lunette-shaped space, and then we have six figures on either side, four kneeling, two standing, and all facing this central tree of life. We also have things hanging down under the tree that resemble sort of pine cones. And we can consider this fresco in relation to a manuscript fragment that was also found in the ruins of Gaocheng, the capital of the Uyghur Khanagate, uh, and located near Beziklik. So here are Manichaean priests seated with desks on their laps, uh, writing pa on papers while in this garden-like setting. You can notice that we have the same types of trees here with very slender, elegant trunks with large blossoms. And then the objects hanging down, we can now see our bunches of grapes. Now, as you may know, grapes grow on vines, not trees. So we can assume that this is perhaps more of a symbolic or a metaphorical tree than a literal tree. This is not a literal, realistic garden. Rather, it's standing in here for the realm of divine light, the highest level of Manichaean heaven. So perhaps the people gathered in this fresco on the right are shown here in an aspirational sense. That is, they hope to eventually reach this state of being. Or perhaps they are deceased, and this is a memorial to them. The third and final cave complex for today is called Mogao. And Mogao is located near the town of Dunhuang, near where the three routes around the Taklamakan Desert meet, meaning that it would have been a place with a lot of east-west traffic. Dunhuang is an, also an oasis town. It's a critical source of water in an otherwise dry area. Dunhuang and Mogao are also close to Xi'an, the capital of the Chinese Empire under the Xi and Tang dynasties. But Mogao became an important place of pilgrimage and a site where rulers and important figures could express their piety in the form of sponsored temples. Now, Mogao is especially important not only because it is the best preserved of the three sites, but also due to other discoveries made there. This man, Wang Yan Lu, was sort of the self-appointed caretaker and conservator of the Mogao Caves in the early 20th century. They had been pretty much abandoned for hundreds of years, and so he sort of set about her tidying the place up, protecting it, conserving it. And one day, Wang discovered a cave that had been sealed up, and in it were thousands of documents. Estimates range from 33 to 50,000 in over 15 different languages and different scripts, ranging in date from the 5th to the early 11th centuries. On the right is a photograph of the French scholar Paul Peillot in this so-called library cave, as it's been called, and he's looking through manuscripts. You can see that the different manuscripts are absolutely packed into this room. They are just piled head height and, and taller. Wang notified the Chinese authorities of his discovery, but they didn't really pay attention for a long time. And so Peyo bought many of the scroll scrolls from Wang for, frankly, a criminally low amount of money, as did many other scholars, including a Japanese expedition. 
Uh, Wong probably needed the money in order to carry out other conservation projects at the site. We don't know why the room was sealed up and hidden, but whatever the reason, it preserved all of these documents, some of which are incredibly rare. For example, it was at Mogao that this scroll was found in explaining Manichaean beliefs. It's one of a mere handful of documents that exist on the religion. There's also a Zoroastrian prayer written in Sogdian, examples of the now extinct Kuchian language, and even a Jewish prayer written in Hebrew. Now, scholars have even identified the handwriting of this document as belonging to someone who lived in or near Babylon, meaning that this document somehow traveled thousands of miles from Mesopotamia, across the mountains, across the Taklamakan Desert, to end up in this little cave at Mogao. Did it travel with a single person the whole way? We don't know. But the fold lines tell us that it was folded up very, very small, small enough perhaps to be worn in a sort of locket or a pouch around the neck as a kind of personal talisman. Now, there are around 735 caves at Mogao, and over 60% of them have painting, sculpture, or both. The largest sculpture is housed in Cave 96, and its facade is shown on the right. It's very recognizable. It's called the Great Buddha, and you can see why. It's about 116 feet tall, and since it's enclosed in this protective structure, it's pretty much impossible to actually photograph. It was constructed on orders of the Chinese Empress in 695 CE, so that gives you just a sense of how important this site was and how much it benefited from the imperial patronage. According to legend, the first cave at Mogao was created around 366 CE by a monk named Yuizhen, who was inspired by a vision of a thousand Buddhas. Caves and shrines continued to be made at Mogao until the 14th century, but the site's prominence and popularity really seems to have dropped off significantly after 907 CE with the end of the Tang Dynasty. But with such a long period of activity, we get to see lots of different styles at Mogao, and with hundreds of caves, there's no way we can cover the whole site in the few minutes remaining in this talk. So I want to refer you to the site itunlang.com. It's a Chinese uh, digitization project of the caves, and it will automatically take you to the Chinese version of the site, but you'll want to click the globe uh, and then select English, and then just click the button on the left to accept. You have to create an account. Um, and just a heads up, the search function in English is not very good, uh, but you can still browse around and see uh, full scans of the caves. So for now, we're just going to look at a few highlights from some of the caves. This is cave 85. It's a good example of what many of the temple caves at Mogao looked like during the late Tang Dynasty. You'll notice that instead of the Indian influence layout with the stupa pillar in the middle, like we saw at Kizil, uh, this is a rectangular or square room, and the ceiling slopes up into a recessed square in the center, and this is the typical sort of format. The new trend in painting around this time is to create illustrations of sutras, or Buddhist religious texts, and almost all of the paintings in Cave 85 are examples of this, depicting texts and themes associated with the Pure Land School of Buddhism. Now here, for example, is a detail from Cave 85 showing a dancer and musicians in the celestial heavenly realm called the Pure Land. In Pure Land Buddhism, this is a perfect land that practitioners hoped to reborn, be reborn into. Uh, it's a place that is accessible solely through spiritual practices, and this is important because it means that it's accessible to the non-elite. Anyone can go there. So in order to express the idea of such a perfect Pure Land, the images are beautiful. They are graceful, lively, but balanced. We have the swirling silks of the dancer. There's a limited color palette, so it's really harmonious throughout. And it's a really just lovely, lovely scene. 
Another common element of the Mogao Caves is the incorporation of sometimes quite extensive sculptural groups like you see here. And these statues are usually made of plaster, sculpted over a wooden core, and then painted. They're usually life-sized, and you can imagine that the presence of these figures, very three-dimensional, very lifelike, and sharing the same space as the visitor, they would have been very striking, especially since original visitors to the caves would have been using lamps for illumination, and so the flickering and shifting light would have added another element of lifelikeness to these figures, as if you really were in the presence of the Buddha and his guardians. Now, one of my favorite uh, works from Mogao, and one of the most remarkable, is this stunning painting of the Bodhisattva Guanyin. A Bodhisattva is a being who has achieved Buddhahood and could leave and ascend into non-being, uh, but they instead choose to stay behind and help others on their path towards enlightenment as well. Guanyin is thus appropriately represented as a beautiful, luminous being of compassion and grace, draped in jewelry that is not simply painted, but it's actually sculpted using plaster so that it has three-dimensionality, as you can see in the photo on the right. It was then covered in gold leaf, so in a sense, the painting is actually wearing specially crafted jewelry. <laughs> This combination of flat painting and sculpted ornament is very interesting because it blurs the line between the depicted world and the real world, as if these paintings are coming to life. And as this blurs the line between that division, it's just as the bodhisattvas sit at the threshold of nirvana, serving as guides for our world. Guanyin is especially interesting as an example of how ideas and figures can change as they are transmitted from culture to culture. So in India, Guanyin is known as Avalokiteshvara and is considered to be either male or sexless. We have an image here on the right from the caves at Ajanta. But as Avalokiteshvara traveled through Central Asia and into China, however, he becomes Guanyin, a female figure represented as the ideal feminine beauty. You can see a later sculpture on the left. So Guanyin actually continues to travel east and there it becomes Kanon in Japan, as we'll see in our next talk. And once our Silk Road travelers reach Dunhuang, the remainder of the trip to Xi'an is really quite straightforward and highly regulated. They are in official Chinese territory now, not just tribute states or protectorates, and only the highest ranking government officials are allowed to travel freely within China. Travelers are issued a travel pass when they reach the border. Here's an example of one of these passes written in Kuchian and found at a Chinese military outpost in the Tarim Basin. I apologize for the quality of this photo, but it's scanned out of a book. It's the best I could find. Each pass states the number of people in the party and their status, so are they um, men, women, slaves, etc., uh, the number of animals that they have, their ultimate destination, the route that they'll follow, and then the name of the official issuing the pass. Along the way, the travelers have to present their pass to the next official who tracks that the information is correct and then issues a new pass that will take them on to the next checkpoint. And if there is any change in the information between checkpoints, then you would better have a very good reason for why that happened. In fact, there's, we have a story about uh, one traveler who did not report to the next checkpoint and they sent guards to go and find him. And it turned out that he had gotten sick and had been staying at an inn. And so in this highly supervised fashion, our travelers reach Xi'an the capital city of the Chinese Empire under the Sui and Tang dynasties, and considered the eastern terminus of the Silk Road. However, we know that objects and people and ideas certainly circulated beyond Xi'an, moving farther into China, into Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia, and it is this region that we'll explore next time, including the southern route that connected Southeast Asia with the Persian world by sea. So I hope you'll join me next time, and thanks so much.